school. You had so many options and uh, we were very lucky you chose, chose Berkeley. What was interesting to me is you showed up and of course you, you kind of started thinking even more broadly about how robots and AIs and humans can interact. Doing a PhD was a lot for manipulation robots, but it was very interesting. You, you were just recently arrived at Berkeley and you joined as an addis- additional job on top of your Berkeley job, you joined Waymo. And now I tell when a lot of people, including me definitely at the time, think about self-driving cars and we think about, um, okay, does it really see the stop sign or does it not see the stop sign? I need a better vision system. Or um, does it see the car pedestrian in front? And then of course it needs to hit the brakes in, in a reasonable way and, and not start skidding. And so there's challenges mm-hmm. there. You don't want to brake too hard. And, and so there's a combination of kind of vision and control challenges. And then you went to Waymo. And as I understand it, you, you effectively um, started taking on a whole other suite of problems that was largely ignored. Can you say a bit more about that? Like what if, if a car can perfectly see what's in front of it? and it can perfectly control its path, what are the remaining challenges? Yeah, so, so cars are pretty good these days <laughs> at, uh, at doing those two things. Um, and and uh, they're not everywhere, right? And so it's very natural to ask, well, what's missing? And a way that I'd like to answer this is take, you know, take a busy city like San Francisco mm-hmm. and... And now remove all the people, remove the pedestrians, remove the motorcyclists and the bicyclists, and now remove also all the vehicles that are driven by humans. Mm -hmm. Um, Is there still a big problem left to solve? And the answer is not really. We could could navigate in any city (laughs) that has those properties. Empty cities, no problem. Empty (laughs) cities, no problem, right? Because vision control, all of that, um, it just planning, we can do those things. Um, you know, maybe not, not a bunch of years ago, but these days, uh, the, the, those technologies are really reliable. So, so the, the problem is, how do you get the car to still do the things you want, get there and so on, but, but uh, do it in a way that meshes well with the existence of these other agents, these, uh, these humans that are all mm-hmm. around you things Mm -hmm. and so um so that kind of fell into my my wheelhouse (laughs) of well how do you get robots to to do to generate their behavior when they're not acting in isolation but they're actually acting around people and so the challenges there end up looking like if i want my car to navigate well i need to be able to not just detect where humans currently are Mm -hmm. but it needs to prepare, right? It needs to anticipate certain things. And so it needs to know where humans will be in the future. How far in the future is the kind of still an, an open question, but you know, enough in the future that you can sort of figure out what you're supposed to be doing as the autonomous car. And that prediction is exactly, you know, the sort of thing that, that we were talking about earlier. It's anticipating the decisions that people will make. And um, you can collect a lot of data and, uh, and sort of treat people as black boxes. And then you kind of worry about the robustness of that. And so then you kind of maybe want to think about marrying that with approaches that are more based on, you know, theory of mind assumptions about people. And then yet don't constrain the problem too much with that, right? You don't want to say, well, people work as uh, optimizing for their goal because they don't, and then you'll make the wrong predictions again. And so, so um, figuring out sort of how to navigate the space of what will humans do, that's one problem. And then it gets more interesting because imagine that you're trying to merge on a busy highway. Mm-hmm. And so you have a bunch of people coming, Mm-hmm. The prediction problem for what will they do 
is very easy. They will, you know, they're going at 60 miles an hour. They'll keep going at 60 miles an hour. That is the most likely thing that they'll do. Mm -hmm. And so now your car armed with that information will decide that it has to wait until there's a big enough gap in traffic that it can fit in. But unfortunately, that means that you either sort of stop and wait for a while and then piss off a lot of people behind you, or you uh, keep going hoping that there'll be a, a gap at some point, and then you sort of, you know, miss the, miss the margin, take the exit. And so both of those options are really bad for an autonomous car. And somehow, not that this never happens to people, but this very rarely happens to people. Somehow when faced with this dilemma of, you know, which of these two bad options do I take? People invent a third option, which is they just kind of nudge themselves in there uh-huh. Why? Because, because the, the person behind starts breaking and they create that, that gap in traffic. That, right. And so, so what's going on there? Well, that's more than just a prediction and isolation. That's now about how what the human decides to do depends on the decisions that the robot, the autonomous car is making. Uh-huh. And that kind of back and forth between these these autonomous car decisions and human decisions, that's what I call coordination. So how do you coordinate properly with people? Not just anticipate what they'll do, but anticipate what they'll do in reaction to you. Mm -hmm. And then it gets even more complicated because people also know that, so they not just respond to what the robot is doing, but they know that the robot is responding to what they're doing. Uh So, (laughs) you know... I used to drive a lot, not in the pandemic, but I'd go on the Bay Bridge to commute back to San Francisco from Berkeley. And uh, it's always crowded on the Bay Bridge. Uh-huh. And then there's always some poor person trying to take, you know, make a lane change or do a merge or whatever. And if, if I'm in a good mood, <laughs> I'll slow down <laughs> like a good citizen and let the poor person in. But if I just, you know, had a conversation with Chris and I, uh, uh, and we argued about something and I'm pissed, I might actually be like, no, no, you have to wait and I'll accelerate and then get the person to back. So they started going and I'll accelerate. And then I know that they'll back off because what are they going to do? Right. Are they going to really go in and collide with me? No. Right. So it's hard because not only will people respond to what the robot is doing, but we have to be careful because they'll also try to influence what the robot is doing. They know that the robot mm-hmm. responds to them. And so, and the work that we do at Berkeley on this, we, um, we've figured that the best way to make sense of all of this mess is via something called game theory. Game mm-hmm. theory is the tool that kind of enables us to say we have two agents and they each want to do their own thing. In this case, you know, I want to drive and make progress. You want to drive, and make progress. We both want to not collide with each other. Um, so we each have our own thing that we're trying to go for, but we're, you know, acting in a way where my actions influence what you will, what state you'll be put in and vice versa. And, um, and so that's how we've been, we've been wrapping our heads around this problem is how do I, how do I go about um, solving this, what is called a general sum game. Mm -hmm. And then what gets much more complicated is you can, you can try to solve that It's very complicated computationally, but you can approximate it in various ways. But then (laughs) But then you run into the problem that people are not perfect little game solvers. So you come up with these beautiful solutions of here's how this game is going to work. You're going to go in. um, The person is going to do this thing. If the person accelerates, you have a way of backing out. If the person doesn't accelerate and and breaks, then you can go in. So you can kind of come up with these sort of complicated policies for both the person and the robot. The problem is that people are not you know, game solvers, they don't, they, um, they're not going to take their utility and do the rational thing with respect to their utility. And so, so you have, again, this issue of trying to, if you want to do this realistically, you have to marry that with 
data of how people work and have to account for these, um, you know, potentially systematic biases, systematic deviations from rationality that people have. 